bit here, but um, let's begin. It is 2.02 p.m. here in Southern California. Um, for those of you who don't know who I am, my name is Darren Alf, and I am the Bicycle Touring Pro. Um, I've been running the website at Bicycle Touring Pro for 10 years now. Um, I started it in 2007 after I had already done seven years or so of bike tours all around the world myself. Um, I've ridden my bike across the United States six times in different directions, and I've ridden across, I think, about 70 different countries around the world, um, you know, in Africa, Asia, Europe, South America, et cetera. So, um, yeah, and what I do now is basically I'm a full-time bicycle tourist where I teach people from all around the world how to conduct their own bike tours, and I've written four books about cycling. And um, I have recently started working one-on-one -on -one sort of coaching a small group of people um, to help them plan and prepare for their own bike tours all around the world. So um, I'm moving around here. So that's what actually today um, I was going to do a live broadcast, this live broadcast, just for the coaching members. Um, but I kind of thought today would be an interesting and kind of a fun day to share not only with the 12 individuals that I'm working with right now through the Bicycle Train Pro coaching program, but also to just share with the entire Bicycle Train Pro community. Because the things I want to talk today uh, about are like basic um, touring bike stuff. I want to talk about racks, panniers, and how all of these parts, your bike, the racks, the panniers, et cetera, come together to create your overall touring bicycle. So I'm going to be talking about that today, um, and then once I get past that, I'll probably talk for 20 or 30 minutes, and then after I do that, I'll open it up to Q&A, where um, you will have the opportunity to ask me a question, anything you want, and I will try to answer it. Um, so there is a live chat box kind of over on YouTube on the right-hand side of the screen. Um, um, might be different if you're on a phone or tablet, but... Anyways, um, I'm probably not going to be looking at that right now while I'm talking because I can't really like read the comments and think and talk at the same time. I'm just not that smart. So um, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to talk for the first 20 or 30 minutes, and then um, I will go back and try to answer any questions that you guys have. Sound cool? All right. Let's begin. You probably can see the bicycle behind me, and this is my famous Comotion Pangea Touring Bicycle. It's an American-made bicycle, uh, made in the state of Oregon. And this is just one of hundreds of different types of touring bicycles that you can get and buy and ride. Um, but this is the bike that I'm going to be demonstrating on today. This is kind of an on-road, off-road touring bicycle. You might be able to tell just by looking at it that the wheels are kind of larger than maybe something that you would find on a road bicycle. These are 26-inch wheels. Um, and tires, and they're very similar to what you might find on a mountain bike. And 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 so, like a lot of people, when they when they first see a bike like this, they see like the drop handlebars, right? And that looks very similar to what you might see on a road bicycle, like a racing bicycle. But then they see the thick tires, and and that's very similar to what they might see on a mountain bicycle. And so, touring bikes are kind of unique because um, they aren't oftentimes fully road uh, like warriors. They aren't made just to cycle on the, on the road to go really fast. Um, but they're kind of made to go everywhere in a lot of instances. And there's a bunch of different types of touring bicycles, but this particular type is basically made to go everywhere. And that's why I bought this particular bike is because I wanted a bike that could take me to South America, to Africa. I wanted to be able to cycle on dirt roads and paved roads all around the world. But um, a lot of people, I would say most of the people who do what I call traditional bicycle touring end up cycling on paved roads for most of their time. And so in that instance, you might want a bicycle with narrower tires. And so most, a lot of the popular touring bicycles, I should say, not most, but they either have 26-inch tires like this or they have 700C uh, tires, which are kind of... Uh, how do I describe it? The diameter is a little bit larger, like you would see on a racing bicycle. Um, and the tire is, is narrower than this, but thicker than what you would find on a racing bicycle. So, yeah. Anyways, let's just 
a very, very brief overview. Um, I wrote a book called The Essential Guide to Touring Bicycles, and that book is really what you want to read if you're into um, in the process of like finding and buying and shopping for your first touring bicycle, because that will teach you like all the minor little differences um, between the road and mountain bike models that you are probably used to seeing out there on the road and touring bicycles, because there's a lot of like little differences that make a touring bike like this different than the bike that you're probably accustomed to. And there's a lot of things that make this bicycle better suited for long distance bicycle touring, where you're gonna be sitting on the bike for long periods of time, um, you're gonna be carrying heavy loads potentially, and like I said, you're gonna be potentially riding on paved surfaces or on dirt, dirt terrain, whether it's a dirt road, a gravel road, or even uh, you know, like a narrow single track trail. So anyways, um, that's kind of it. The other, the other thing that you should notice about this bicycle is that there are racks on the bicycle. There's one rack on the front over here, and there's one rack on the back. Can you see that? I'm going to try to get out of the way so you can see it here. But um, let me hold on one second. I want to make sure you can see. OK, so the 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 back rack let's begin there because most bicycles not even not even most touring bicycles but just most bicycles in general like hybrid bikes road bikes sometimes mountain bikes sometimes um most bicycles that you find will have little holes they're called eyelets um right here basically on the back of the bicycle on the frame and there, there's another eyelet down here kind of near your rear hub, okay? I'm just sitting on the floor here. But um, that those two points on both sides, right, one on the left and one on the right, are um, where the rear rack attaches to your bicycle. And so as long as your bicycle has those rear eyelets, you can probably attach a rack to the back of your bicycle. And if you can attach a rear rack like this one to the back of your bicycle, then you can carry a whole bunch of stuff on your bike in a variety of different ways, okay? Um, and, I'll, and I'll talk about that in just a moment here. Um, there, are, there are different types of rear racks. There's a whole bunch of different types, actually. Um, this is probably one of the most common and inexpensive types, this particular rack. I think it cost me about 40 US dollars. It's made by a company called Axiom. They're in Canada. And um, I've had this rack for several years now. I really like it. Um, it's inexpensive. It's made of aluminum. And it's simple. Um, and, but there are other racks that have like multiple, like there is, there's some uh, bike racks that have another, it's kind of like a, a level, another level here. And then, so there's one level up top and one level down below. And, and those racks are made to carry your gear lower on the bicycle in part, and also to carry the, the items that you might carry in the center of the rack up higher. And I'll, I'll, I'll talk about why that is a little bit later, but um, what you should know is that generally, almost any rear rack that you can find or buy on the internet or at your local bike shop or whatever is going to fit on the back of your bicycle. Like I get emails all the time from people saying like, I have a surly long haul trucker, will this tubus whatever bike rack fit on the back of it? Um, and, and usually I just have to reply and say like, I don't know 100% for sure because there's like hundreds and hundreds of bicycles that you can match with hundreds and hundreds of different racks. But for the most part, these, these racks are designed to go on pretty much any bicycle design, okay? So I wouldn't worry too much about that. You basically just wanna get a good rack um, because the rack is basically like an extension of the frame of your bicycle once you mount it. And you want a rack that's gonna be strong enough to carry the gear that you're going to be carrying. Again, I'll talk about that in just a moment. But um, yeah, that's the rear rack. And over here on the front of the bicycle, you, there is a front rack. And this is a, a totally different shape and design of the one that you would see on the back. And this is a low rider uh, front rack. 
And if you look closely, you'll notice that, like, let me show you here. Like, the, the top of the rack here is, is pretty low when you compare it to the top of the rack over here, right? This rack is, like, up above the wheel, up above the top of the wheel. And this rack is kind of like one-third of the way or one-quarter of the way down into the wheel. Now, why is that? Well, there are actually racks that carry, there are actually front racks that carry your gear on top of the front wheel, uh, very similar to the rack that you might find on the back, right? Uh, the reason that I have a low rider front rack that carries the gear lower to the ground is, is much the same way that um, like motorcycles are designed, right? Like um, it, it's because you want to have a low center of gravity. And because it makes your bicycle easier to steer. And, and that's basically it. Um, and so, yeah, just like on a motorcycle, like the engine is not like up four feet off the ground. The engine is usually, they try to put the engine as low to the ground as they possibly can because they want that weight to be really low on the motorcycle so that when you're going around turns and stuff, um, you don't like fall over and die. And it's the same with a loaded touring bicycle. The higher up your gear is, the more, the higher up your weight is, um, the harder it's going to be to, to basically steer and maneuver your bicycle. So that's why the front rack is so low, and that's why some rear racks also drop the weight down um, over, you know, lower down into the base, basically like into the tire and the bottom of the panniers of the bags that you carry on the racks are lower as well. One of the reasons you don't see um, like a low rider rack on the back of my bicycle right now is let me just show you one second. So this is this is a rear pannier. This is an Ortlib uh, Bike Packer Plus waterproof bicycle pannier, and it's basically like a backpack sized bag that fits onto the rack of your bicycle, the racks of your bicycle. And um, panniers like this are usually sold in pairs. So when you see them online, um, you're not just buying one bag. Like I think this set, for example, costs about 240 US dollars. These are like the high-end premium sort of bicycle train bags. They're not cheap. Um, but if you're going to be like getting into bike touring seriously, like these are really, really good ones that I highly recommend. So anyways, it doesn't matter which bags you use at this point. I'm just kind of demonstrating with what I have. But um, yeah, so this is the pannier, and it goes on the rack on your bicycle. So that when you're riding, it just kind of sits there. Um, let me point out just something while I have the pannier here with me. This is a like bucket style um, with a lid style pannier and there are different types of, of bicycle panniers. There are roll top panniers which are like a hundred percent waterproof basically. Like if you've ever gone kayaking or something and you put your phone in like a waterproof bag and then rolled the top and then clipped it together, there are pannier bags that are made in exactly that same sort of way. And they're really good for keeping water out. That's that's really the main thing. I don't have a set like that, and well, I do, but not with me at the moment. But um, these are, like I said, like bucket or lid style panniers. And the difference here is that there's this basically lid. I, I just unclip these two things, and this lid on the top comes off, right? And then, and then I can undo this little drawstring, and then get into whatever I have inside the pannier at the moment, okay? And then every time I close it up, boom the lid just comes back over the top and I buckle these two and then I'm off and then I'm off and on my way. So the reason that you might want to get this type of design instead of the, the more waterproof uh, roll top design is because this style I feel at least is easier to get into. Um, and when you're on a long distance bike tour, like, like for example, I'm planning a three month long bike trip here in Sweden, Norway, and Finland. I'm gonna be on the road for quite a long time. And getting in and out of these bags 
on a daily basis, like multiple times a day. So I want to have something that's like pretty easy to get into when I want to access my jacket or my food or my camping gear or whatever it is that I'm trying to access. And I, found, I find that these bucket style panniers are easier to get into than the roll top kind. So that's just something to keep in mind when you're shopping for bicycle panniers, is you, you're, you're, you're making a trade off basically. If you pick the roll top waterproof kind, that's awesome if you're concerned about keeping whatever is inside your panniers dry, like that's great. Um, these bags are waterproof also, but they aren't like 100% waterproof. If, you, if I were to drop this in a lake or something, the water would just seep in under this lid, right? But um, so I'm, I'm basically, I'm giving up some of the waterproofness of this bag in order to make myself more comfortable once I get on, out on the road and I'm trying to get into these bags on a daily basis. It's just easier to flip up this lid than it is to roll up the pannier every single time. So you kind of have to decide what you want. Do you want 100% waterproof? 100% uh, waterproofness? And if so, you probably want the roll top panniers. Or do you want something that's a little bit easier to get into that's not going to be so annoying on a daily basis? And if so, then this is the, the type of pannier that I would recommend for you. So panniers also come in a number of different sizes. And this is like a small pannier. This is a big pannier. I don't know if you can see the difference here, but I, know, I can't quite remember the size of these two bags. But, but usually, like, front panniers are, are, I think, about, like, 10 to 30 liters in total volume. And the larger panniers are usually, like, 20 to 40 liters in volume. So, um, yeah, just another thing to keep in mind. Um, on the back of every single bike pannier, there are usually some kind of hooks at the top of the bag. And I'm trying to show them to you here. Hopefully you can see that, okay. But this particular pannier has two hooks and most pannier bags do have two hooks. Um, but what is unique to this particular uh, pannier set is that the hooks at the top are self-locking. So in order to, um, <sighs> my feet. <laughs> in order to uh, put this pannier on your bicycle, you, you, had, you attach this bag to the rack. So we're gonna put this on the rear rack of my bicycle in just a moment. But there are these two hooks, and in order to, there's a little mechanism right there at the bottom, and that's the lock, locking part. In order to open it, I just pull up on the handle here. Can you see that? So I'm pulling up on the handle, and that lock disengages, right? And then when I let go of the handle, it automatically comes back down and locks in place. And it's the same with the back one too. So if I pull in the middle of the handle here, both of those mechanisms unlock. And then what I would do is I'd slide the rail of, the, of my rear rack, for example, into this little hole, this little notch. And then I let go of the, the, the handle here and those little mechanisms on the bottom slide into place, right? So I'm, I'm gonna do that on my bicycle in just a moment, but I wanted you to see kind of how it works up close. So you take your pannier, you, you lean it up against the edge of the, the rack. You, once you have the rack in both, both notches here and here, you just simply let go of the handle and it'll lock in place. Also on the bottom of this particular pannier is a little hook at the bottom. And every pannier, company does this differently, uh, partially for patent and copyright reasons, I believe. But um, yeah, and so like some, some pannier bags, they don't have a hook at the bottom. Some, um, some like this one, they have an adjustable hook, like this hook, for example, like you can loosen it and then you can move it all over the place. See that? So like I could put it over here and make it point in this direction or something. And the reason for that is, um, every single bike rack, like I mentioned a moment ago, is different, right? Those racks on the back of your bike, like the design is going to be different depending on which one you buy. And so the pannier bags are designed to fit basically on any type of rack. In much the same way that the racks are designed to fit on almost any type of bike, 
the pannier bags, in, in a lot of cases at least, are designed to fit on almost any type of rack. And so this particular bag um, has this adjustable hook at the bottom, which allows you to adjust to whatever type of rack you have. You can move this into place. And the purpose of this little hook at the bottom um, is to basically keep the pannier bag from rattling around while it's on your bicycle. Because um, like some of the lower quality, like less expensive um, pannier bags that you're going to find, like if you go on Amazon, for example, and like type in, I don't know, cheap panniers or something, cheap bicycle panniers, you might find a set of panniers for like forty dollars. But what they're probably what they probably have as far as mounting gear on the back is just two metal hooks, like up here at the top, and that's it. Um, they won't be locking hooks, and they might not have this uh, mechanism at the bottom to keep the pannier secured in place as you're riding. And the danger with those types of panniers, like th those panniers can be used fine um, if you're riding on perfectly like smooth pavement. Um, but those, those particular bags are not good if you're going to be riding on any sort of bumpy or rocky terrain. I used to have a set um, myself. I can't remember what company they were, but I used them on like a, like a couple of my first bike tours, maybe my first two bike tours. And um, what would happen is if I'd hit like a speed bump or something, like a bump in the road, the, the, because there was no lock on the top of the pannier to keep the bag locked on my bicycle, what would happen is I would hit this bump and the pannier would jump up a little bit and fly completely off of my bicycle, which is incredibly dangerous if there's cars passing and the bags flying off of your bicycle, right? So. I would recommend looking for pannier bags that at, at the very least have this uh, some kind of locking mechanism up at the top of the pannier um, with, the, with the, the hooks, whatever kind of hooks they happen to have. If um, they don't have the locks up at the top, you want to make sure that there's some kind of uh, locking mechanism at the bottom. Now this particular bag, like I said, just has an adjustable hook here which I don't think is that great, to be honest. Um, but there are other companies, like there's a company called, um, I'm blanking, Arke Arkel, which is from Canada, and they make pannier bags. Um, and they have like a, a, I think it's very good, it's like a bungee cord, it's like a hook on a bungee cord, basically, so that when you attach that hook to the bottom of your rear uh, bicycle rack, the bungee kind of, is basically like pulling on the rack and keeping it firmly in place. So I think that's really good. So that's another thing that you want to look for is like either a hook like this of some kind at the bottom of the bag or a bungee corded hook, right? And yeah, I, I don't know. The other thing I guess I should is worth mentioning is like less expensive bicycle panniers. The hooks are just are basically like set in this position. Um, this particular type of pannier, because it is kind of like top of the line, uh, has an adjustable quality to it. So that I can I can basically like move these hooks to any position I want, right? So I can move, now I can move this hook way to the outside of the bag. I can move it way in here or whatever. And the reason that is good is because, like I said, like it, every single bike rack is going to be different. And, and so you need those hooks basically to fall in the gaps. Like, do you see those, you know, like basically the hooks go here and here, right? And so you want to be able to adjust the hooks at the top of your pannier to fall into those gaps. And, and yeah, so something like this, an adjustable quality is also like really nice to look for. But like I said, it's kind of only found in, in the mo more expensive bicycle panniers. So that's something to look for when you you know when you're considering bike panniers is like you kind of get what you pay for. The cheap panniers are just going to have some metal hooks here at the top, nothing at the bottom. Up from that, there's probably going to be hooks at the top here, and then the, there will be some kind of hook or bungee cord at the bottom of that. Next level up, you're going to have the locking mechanism of some kind, and then uh, on top of that, next level, top level like this bag 
you're going to have some kind of adjustability to where the hooks are and that sort of thing. That's basically it um, about this pannier. This pannier has a little pocket on the front, nothing special about that. Most pannier bags are basically just one big compartment. Like there is no like, I don't know, like multiple pockets like you might find on a backpack or anything. It's pretty much just usually, not always, but usually just kind of a big bag in which you put and organize all your things. So, ooh, it's getting dark outside. Um, what do I want to show you? Before I put this bag on the bike, um, this, there's also something I should mention. Now, do you see how my bike is just leaning up against the wall? Um, I don't have a kickstand on this bicycle, and in 17 years of bicycle touring all around the world, I've never really used a kickstand on any of my long distance bike tours. I've used it on shorter ones and stuff. But um, most of the time, I just find something to lean my bicycle up against. And if there is nothing to lean my bike up against, I lay it on the ground. Um, there are some people I know, um, because I've met them, that will not put their bike on the ground. Um, I understand that, especially if you've paid a lot of money for your bike and you're trying to keep it scratch free. Um, but uh, generally, putting your bike on its side, on the right side, well, I'll talk about the side in a moment, but laying your bike on its side won't hurt it if you're careful. But what, what you should notice here is that my bicycle is leaned up against the wall with the right side of the bicycle leaned up against the wall. The right side of the bike is usually always on most, on pretty much every bicycle in the world, is where the chain, the derailleurs, the chain rings, the gearing, all of that is located on the right side of the bicycle, okay? And so my, my thinking at least is that if, so. If my bicycle now, if I lean it up against the wall and it were to fall, right? So like, here's the bike. So if it, if it were leaned up against the wall here and it were to fall this way, it's, it's falling now on the left-hand side of my bicycle. And the left-hand side is not where the gearing is located. And that's exactly the, the point. Um, if I were to have put my bike this way, now the gearing is exposed on the right-hand side of the bicycle. So if, if my bike were to fall this direction now, and there was a rock here or a curb or who knows what, right? And my bike falls and hits that sort of thing, my chain could break, I could break um, some of the gears you know, off of my cassette or my, I could break the derailleur or that sort of thing. So generally, whenever I have my bicycle, you know, I'm looking for a place to lean it up against a tree or a fence or a wall or anything, I put it with the right side of the bicycle facing that object, okay? And along the same lines, when we go to put the gear on our bicycles, like, and you're packing your stuff, one of the things you want to do, if you have anything that's, like, delicate, like, I carry my laptop computer on my bicycle as I ride on a lot of my long-distance bike trips. And so I always keep my computer, the pannier bag carrying my computer, on the right-hand side of my bicycle. So that once again, if my bike, so I'm going to show you here. So like, this is now, I, I've mounted that rear right pannier bag on my bicycle. And this is where I usually carry my laptop computer. So now, once again, if my bike falls over, the laptop is on the other side, right? And whatever was over here on the left side of my bike is getting squished, right? So um, just something to keep in mind. It's kind of one of my little secret bike touring techniques. Um, you just get little things like that that you do over and over and over again on a bike trip, like leaning your bike up against the wall to run into a supermarket or um, lean your bike up against a tree to set up camp. So it's just something to think about um, as you go about packing for your bike tour so that you pack those delicate items on the right-hand side. Um, also, like, grab some water here. But um, most places in the world, you cycle on the right-hand side of the road and with cars passing you on the left. So there is, like, this small chance that a, bike, a car or something could clip you 
as you're as you're cycling past and hopefully they clip you on the left hand side of your bicycle where you're carrying less important items so you know they clip you in your bag carrying your sleeping bag or whatever gets ripped off that's less important than your bag carrying your computer or camera gear or whatever else you happen to have so anyways yeah so it, i've got one bag on there now and i'll put this other one on really quick so there's two like i said so like this particular set i think it costs about 240 us dollars to buy this set um, and that's just the two panniers on the back of the bike so again like to put this on the rack it's kind of hard to do on a webcast here but um basically i just pull up on the handle here and then I attach those top hooks to the top of the bike rack. And once I have it in place, I just let go of the handle and then it locks itself in place. And now they're on there like so, okay? Now most people, when they're getting started with bicycle touring, like, like if you've probably seen pictures of me on my bike tours all around the world, you've seen me with four panniers on my bike plus a handlebar bag and maybe with some other things on my bike as well. But when you're just starting out, like this is basically all you need to get started. Like a rear set of like larger pannier bags like this, this is really all you need to get started to do shorter, shorter bike tours, okay? So you, there isn't really like a need for a lot of people to go out and buy that front rack uh, and maybe even to buy a fully low, you know, a touring bicycle designed for long distance bike tours. Like, I first started bike training on a mountain bike that I, my dad just had in the garage for years that wasn't being used. Um, and that's what I got started on. It didn't have um, the ability for a front rack or anything like that. So I just started like this, okay? And that's how most people do get started. In fact, is they put a rear rack on their bicycle, buy two panniers of any kind, and then load those panniers up with gear. Now, the other thing worth mentioning is that um, in addition to those two panniers that are now on the back of the bicycle, there's also some space in the middle of the panniers on top of the rear rack. I'll show you. Okay, so yeah, this might be good actually. You can kind of see how this attaches. But so this is right the back of the rack and I'll just kind of slide it on here so you can see it, but I, I'm holding the handle up so that these locks are disengaged, and then I simply slide it down and until it's in position on at the top of the, the rail, on the top of the rack here, and then once I have it in position, I simply let go of the, the handles, right? And now it's locked in place and can't come off of there. Same over here, right? But there is this space in the middle here, and what a lot of people do, like, it, especially if you don't want to go out and buy front panniers or anything is they pack things in their panniers and then they can carry items on top of the bag uh, on top of this rear rack here and, and I, I got to take this off to show you how that's done but what you want to do is you need a single bungee cord like this one I'm not exactly sure how long this is. I think it's about 20 inches, maybe maybe 18 inches, something like that. Um, and you attach basically one end down here at the bottom of the rack, okay, on one side, and then you run it over to the other side, down here, and attach the other side at the bottom of the rack as well. So now your bungee cord is basically just sitting over the top of the rack there. Can you see that? Like that. And now we put the panniers on. Okay, so I'm gonna put the panniers back on. Okay, here's one. Oops. There's two. Okay, and now we have this bungee cord in the middle that we can put stuff in, and I'll show you. So like, maybe what a lot of people carry here is their tent, right? And here's my tent. This is a Big Agnes Copper Spur one-man 
tent, really lightweight, weighs about three pounds or so, I think. And anyways, um, all I do to carry it on the back of my bike now is I lift the bungee cord up and basically slide the tent into the bungee cord. A little difficult to do, but yeah, <laughs> especially when I'm trying to show you. Okay, anyways, there it is, and that's pretty much it. Um, it's hard to see, I'm trying to show you, but can you see that? So the bungee cord is just basically holding the tent now in place on the top of the rear rack of my bicycle. And I could ride like this for miles and miles and miles, not having to worry really about the tent falling off or anything like that, as long as you have it well secured, right? I have a rear light on here too, which is kind of a nice thing to have. Um, when, you're, when you're looking to buy a rear rack, um, look for to see if it has like a mounting plate for a light just it's not like super important because like like this light for example like I could mount it here where the light is supposed to actually go or I could mount it over here on the panniers like like this pannier has this little strap or whatever so you, you know it's not super important but just something to keep in mind while we're back here Anyways, but like what a lot of people will do, um, especially if they're kind of on a budget and, and like I said, they don't have a bike that's equipped with front panniers or a front rack, is that they will load a whole bunch of items up here on the back of their bicycle. Like right now I just have the tent here, but other people will put like stuff like way up here, like up above their seat basically. And I don't recommend doing that. Um, and there's a number of different reasons why. One, uh, it just looks, you look like a homeless person. Two, um, your, 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 you know, your center of gravity now is getting much higher. You want to keep your weight as low as possible generally. And three, when, you know, when, when your items are packed, come on. <laughs> When your items are packed uh, inside your panniers, you don't have to worry about them falling off of your bike and like getting lost while you're out there on the road. But when you have them bungee corded on the back, especially if you have multiple items bungee corded onto the back, you, you do kind of have to worry about them falling off. Um, so like if you had your, your tent and your sleeping bag and your sleeping mat and all that stuff and like a jacket or and I've you know I've seen crazier things on the back of people's bicycles but um, if you have like all of that kind of stuff just bungee corded on um, there there is the potential that it could fall off you hit a bump or something something pops off you don't even notice and you cycle 20 miles or 30 kilometers down the road before you even realize that your gear is missing so that's why I like to pack pretty much all of my stuff if I can, inside of my panniers. Not only does it protect my stuff from like falling off my bike, but it also protects my stuff in general from rain or, and sun and all that kind of thing. So if you can, pack everything in two panniers on the back of your bicycle. If you can't do that, if you need a little bit more space, like we did here, um, leave room for your, your tent or your sleeping bag or something like that, something that could potentially get wet um or the bag that it's in could get wet at least um in the middle of the rear rack and then if you can't do that like you still have stuff that you want to bring with you the next thing that you want to consider is a handlebar bag and this is just one of many different types of handlebar bags this is probably one of the larger types and this is a matching Ortlib uh, Ultimate 6 handlebar bag. It's pretty large. It's about the size of like a toaster. <laughs> that's, that's basically how big it is. And um, there are a number of little mesh pockets on the outside here and stuff. But basically on the inside, it's just one big pocket. Um, there's a little zippered pocket here or something to keep your wallet or whatever. Um, but what you want to do now, this bag goes up here on the front of the bike, okay? And it just kind of snaps in place there. Um,
but handlebar bags are really cool and and I kind of like going on bike trips now where my handlebar bag um, is in that position I, I feel kind of naked without a handlebar bag now and the nice thing about a handlebar bag is that like a lot of the things that you want to access uh, on a bicycle tour like your camera your map um, even like snacks food um, what else? I don't know. Just like, like maybe even just basic um, tools. Why am I holding my light? Um, things like that can go inside your handlebar bag, so that as you're riding, even excuse me, so that as you're riding, you can have very quick access to those items. So without the handlebar bag, for example, like you, if you were carrying a map, a paper map on your bicycle with only those rear panniers, you might have to every time you want to check the map. You might have to stop, get off your bike, open the pannier, pull out the map, look at where you're going, put the map back, close the pannier up, and then continue down the road. But with that handlebar bag, your map is right in front of you now. And um, it just makes your time out there on the road so much easier. You will see these handlebar bags on a lot of like road touring bicycles, touring bikes that are designed to go on the road, paved roads but they aren't so common on off-road touring bicycles or on like but like bike packing is becoming very popular which is basically bicycle touring off-road and and you won't see handlebar bags like this um, on those sorts of setups too often but i think for most people who do road-based tours this is a good setup and this is like your ultimate lightweight bicycle touring setup that most people start out with so two panniers in the back potentially some gear on the rear rack with a bungee cord and then a handlebar bag of some kind up front. Then if you still have gear that you are wanting to carry with you, um, that's when the front panniers come in, right? And these are the smaller front panniers and they attach just like the larger ones do um, with the locking mechanism and the hook down at the bottom and everything else. Um, and yeah, I'll put those on now so you can see. All right, so now in this configuration, this is what we call a fully loaded touring bicycle. So we got panniers, two panniers on the back, two panniers on the front with a handlebar bag up top. And this is, in my opinion, about as heavy as you wanna get. Now I have seen people carrying more than this. Some people have frame packs on top of this so that there are bags, little bags that maybe go under their seat post or maybe other bags that go on the top or on the bottom of their top tube. That's also a possibility. Um, and then I've seen other people carrying trailers and other panniers like the yeah trailers basically in addition to all of this gear that you already see on my bicycle now again i do not recommend that i think this is about as heavy as anybody should probably get um but uh yeah anyways that's just i just wanted to see you kind of i wanted you to see the progression of how like this is how I usually ride with all this stuff because I'm carrying like a lot of gear and electronics and things like that. But um, you don't have to immediately jump to this setup. I, I, I do fear sometimes that by showing people how I pack that they're gonna pack too heavy for their own bike tours. So I would, like I said, start with the two panniers in the back um, and figure out if that's gonna be enough room for you. Then add the handlebar bag if necessary, and then add the front panniers as like your last resort. Um, the other thing I should say, I want to open this up to Q and A because I've already been talking way too long. But like a lot of people um, carry, like when you're packing, like the the bags on the left side should be about the same weight as the bags on the right side, on both the front and the back. But a lot of people like to carry about sixty percent of the weight. Um, that they're carrying on the front of their bike and that would be maybe divided you know between in this particular configuration between the handlebar bag and the front pannier so 60% of the weight up here and 40% of the weight back here other people like to switch it around and have about 60% of the weight back here 
and 40% up here. It's kind of personal preference. I don't think it makes like that big of a difference, to be honest. Um, but the, the thinking of that is that because once you sit on the bicycle, you're the heaviest thing that your bike is going to be carrying. Um, most of your body weight goes to this back wheel, right? And so that's why a lot of people push their weight that they're carrying up to the front so that the, the weight is dispersed more evenly across the frame of your bicycle. So just another thing to keep in mind um, while you're packing and preparing for your bike tours. Um, gosh, there's so much more I could talk about, but I want to open it up to Q&A, so I'm going to kind of stop talking now. And if you have any other questions, you can ask me. Um, let me go back to the screen where I can see your questions. I have too many screens open. OK. I hope that was kind of useful for some of you. Like I said, these are, these are really like basic um, packing techniques, but I know that there are people coming from all different uh, experience levels. So um, I'm, anyways, I'm looking at your questions here. I'm probably, if I missed your question or something, I'm sorry, but um, Gary says, Darren, what kind of camera do you use? Um, go to BicycleTurnPro.com and type in camera gear. I have a whole article there about the, the gear that I use because I, I actually use a series of different cameras. And um, yeah, but I have basically like a Canon DSLR, a point and shoot. I use my cell phone sometimes. I also have been carrying a drone on my bicycle for the last year or so. Um, uh, <laughs> Sorry, I'm trying to get to ah, get to all the questions. Here's my parent. I'm at my parents' house right now in Southern California. This is their their pet dog. Can you see it? This, <laughs> her name is well. My parents call her Pippi, but I call her Poopy. And well, you can guess why I call her Poopy. But um, <laughs> anyway, she's kind of interrupting the broadcast here. Um, I'm trying to see your questions. Ah, the thing keeps resetting. Um, Aiden says, "Do the disc doesn't the disc brakes interfere with the rack mounting points? And if so, how do you come around it? Have you ever uh, had really hot disc brakes that burn or mark your stuff? So, yeah, well, th that is one of the." probably advantages to buying like a, a an actual dedicated touring bicycle is that like if you do use your road bike or your mountain bike for example for a tour bicycle touring adventure it might be that that the disc brakes that are on your bike are not going to allow for the racks um, or panniers that you choose to carry that is why one of the many little things that makes a touring bicycle like this one, a bike that is designed specifically for bicycle touring, um, they, they have considered that when, when it comes to their the disc brakes. And so they've gone out of their way to make sure that that won't be an issue. So again, it just depends on, on the bike you're using basically. But if you have like an actual touring bicycle, you probably, you really shouldn't have that problem. And no, I've never, I don't think I've ever burnt anything other than my finger um, by touching my disc brakes, <laughs> but yeah. Um, I want to bring a guitar on my tour. What's the best way to mount or carry it? Um, that's a good question. I'm not exactly sure. It probably depends on the size of the guitar. Um, I have seen several people with guitars and ukuleles on their bike tours. I, I carried a skateboard on one of my bike tours. Um, but you might be best off with a trailer of some kind. Um, because I, I just don't know if there there are ways that, like I saw a guy carrying a, a guitar on the back of his bike but he had some like very custom rack that he basically built himself in, in like the, the, the guitar basically pointed up behind his back like right here but I don't know how he was carrying it there um, to be honest I'm really not so sure it's not a common thing to see someone going down the road with a guitar but that'd be pretty cool. Um, I would probably recommend a trailer. 
do you find flying with lithium battery batteries a problem with your airlines? No, I've never had a problem actually. And usually, like I carry, um, you know, I have like five different cameras that I'm bringing with me on my bike tours, and I I bring all of the spare batteries with me on the airplane. There are um, limits to the size, excuse me, size of the batteries that you can carry. So as long as you're under that limit, you should be fine. Like even the drone batteries and stuff that I've been carrying are under that limit. So um, haven't had any problems. Um, Mercea says, are expensive bike racks worth it? Well, I, um, I'm not sure how to answer that question because like my front rack, for example, is, is kind of an expensive rack. It costs like 125 US dollars and I've had it for about 12 years. No problems whatsoever. It's thousands and thousands and thousands of miles on that front rack. And I just don't ever see myself replacing it. it as long as it keeps going, I'm gonna keep it. Um, this rear rack I've replaced several times over the years. And that's because every time I replace it, I buy like another 40 to $60 bike rack. And then over, the t over time, it needs replacing. So maybe, you know, maybe it is um, worth it in the long run to buy a good bike rack. The other thing I should say is like a lot of the cheaper bike racks are made out of aluminum and the more uh, expensive bike racks are made out of steel. And um, so that's part of what you're paying for when it comes to the price, but also you're paying for the ability to fix that bike rack somewhere in the, in the world. And that's another thing like a lot of touring bicycles um, have that's unique about them is they're made out of steel, which makes them easier to repair once you get out on the road. Um, so if you're in South America, for example, and you have a steel touring bicycle, pretty much like any um, welder is going to be able to fix your bike. And same if you have steel bike racks, if it, if it cracks or breaks or something like that, um, if it's made of steel, most people in the world can fix it. Whereas if your rack or bike is made out of aluminum, it's a whole lot harder to fix, might be impossible. So um, that's part of what you're paying for when you buy an expensive bike rack um, is steel, is the, longe the longevity of that rack and the ability for it to be fixed anywhere in the world. Um, Paul says, do you use a Dynamo hub? Now a Dynamo hub for people who don't know is like a hub that generates um, electricity up at the top of the basically your it's usually your front wheel and I don't have that on my bicycle at the moment but I want to get one um, I'm hoping to get a new bike this year I I'm, I've been told it's gonna come in time for my next bike tour which is uh, less than a month away but um, no sign of it yet so I'll let you know how that works out for me um, but no, I've never used the Dynamo Hub on any of my bike tours. Um, Edward, jo Edward Jones says, how do you choose the right saddle and why don't you wear padded shorts? That's two big questions. I'm going to answer your padded short question first because I, um, if you go to Bicycle Train Pro and type in saddle, I have a big article there about how to pick the right saddle and that sort of thing. So um, go there for that answer. As far as the padded shorts go, um, I, I am not necessarily recommending that others don't wear padded shorts just because I don't wear padded shorts. Um, it's more of a personal style sort of thing for me rather than anything to do with comfort. Um, but I choose not to wear padded bike shorts because I spend a lot of my bike tours like interacting with people, going into stores, um, that sort of a thing. And I want to look normal when I step off of my bicycle at any point throughout my bike tour. I don't want to um, scare the locals with how tight my shorts are. So that's part of why I choose not to. Um, also, I, I just find that the padded bike shorts are not as comfortable for me over the long term. Like I, I think padded bike shorts are great if you're doing short bike trips near your home. Like I think for me, like the first hour or two wearing padded bike shorts is super comfortable. But after that, I, I have found at least that they get less comfortable as the day go on, days and days go on. So that's why I've just kind of gotten used to wearing regular sort of like skateboard style, uh, almost like cargo shorts when I'm riding my bike 
um, that look normal as soon as I step off the bike at the end of the day, but they also feel comfortable um, when I'm on the bike as well. So that's just a personal preference sort of thing. Like I said, I don't want um, anyone to think that I'm saying you shouldn't wear padded shorts. I'm just saying if you like wearing padded shorts, wear them, go for it. But if you don't, uh, don't feel like just, you know, I, I think a lot of people that come into the bicycle bicycling world for the first time um, see people wearing those bike shorts and think, I want to ride a bike, but I don't want to wear those shorts. Um, and I think, you know, you shouldn't let that stop you because there are lots of people, myself included, that have never really worn padded bike shorts and probably never will. So anyways, yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, what is your opinion on tarp tents? Any experience with tarp tents? Yes, I've, I've actually used something like that um, in the past, um, which is basically a tent with no floor. Um, and that's kind of open to the environment or whatever. I like them as far as the fact that they're generally lightweight and lighter than what you would find in a traditional tent, uh, even an ultralight sort of tent. The thing I don't like about them is the exposure to bugs, bugs. That's the main thing. Like, excuse me, I'm planning a trip to Sweden, Norway, and Finland where in the summertime, the mosquitoes can be pretty intense. Um, I think the mosquitoes in Finland are the worst I've ever experienced, maybe anywhere in the world. So to be in a tent where the mosquitoes can just fly in down on the ground um, scares me a little bit. And that's generally why I don't use that kind of a tent myself, is I want to be protected not just from the elements, rain and snow and whatever, but also from bugs. Um, Good Soul says, do you wear a helmet? Yes, I pretty much always wear a helmet. If you've watched any of my bicycle touring vlogs, videos, you'll see that I have a helmet on like 99% of the time. I do occasionally wear it, ride without one on my head, but that's very, very rare. Um, where in Sweden will you be riding? Well, at this point, I, I know that I'm going to ride from Umia, Sweden, which is way up north up above the Arctic Circle, um, up to Nordkap, Norway, which is the northernmost point in all of Europe. Basically, like from there, you can see the North Pole and Santa Claus and the elves and everything. So um, that'll be pretty cool, I think. Um, and I'm gonna be traveling on one of the Eurovelo routes that goes from Umia to Nordkap. Um, I, I forget what the route is called. I'll, I'll look at, I think it's called the Sun Route or something like that. But anyways, um, yeah, so that's going to be a good trip. It's going to be about 25 days up there from Umia up to North Cap Norway and then back. So 25 days on the road, sleeping in the forest, no for no uh, you know no showers. Probably I'll just be jumping in lakes and that sort of a thing. Um, yeah, it's going to be awesome. I'm really looking forward to it. Um, <laughs> Evan says, would you recommend a North Korea tour? I don't think so, probably. Not for most people. I don't think most people can even get there. So, yeah, probably not. But but I hear South Korea is fantastic, actually. Tons of bike paths, friendly people. I, I really want to go to South Korea. Um, uh. um, any other questions? Water. Um, I see a question about water. How do you carry enough water? Well, how do you carry enough food and water, right? Um, this video today was going to originally be just for members of my Bicycle Turn Pro coaching program. Um, for the last month and a half or so, I've been working with a small group of like 12 people to help them plan, prepare for, and execute their own bike tours all around the world. And in that, uh, course where I've been working with these people, um, we've kind of been talking about how to map out your routes. And I've created like hours of demonstration videos that show you exactly how to use the computer basically and your smartphone to map out safe and enjoyable bicycle turn routes all around the world using free tools like Google Maps, Google My Maps, Google Earth, that sort of a thing. Um, so 
um, yeah, in those videos and in this course that I'm teaching now, um, I teach you how to kind of figure out where you need to restock on food, where to restock on water, that sort of thing. But basically, like every town that you get to on a bike tour, um, you know, you ride into town, you get you, you fill up on food and water or whatever, but you're also looking at your map and trying to figure out where is the next place that I am going to for sure be able to get food and water. And that, you know, it's sometimes very difficult to tell just by looking at a map but usually, if there's a town or a city or something, there's usually somewhere to get food and water. So um, yeah, it's just basically like taking it step by step, uh, day by day, and and you know, uh, looking always looking ahead multiple steps um, to figure out where the next food and water source is going to be. You know, um, like good chess players, like like people that are average at chess, like that the move that is right in front of them. They look at the next move that they're gonna do. Where can I go? What can I do right now in this next move, right? But really good chess players, they look multiple moves ahead. So they're not just looking one or two moves ahead, they're thinking seven or eight different moves ahead on the chessboard. And the same is true with bicycle terrain and like a whole lot of sports, like soccer, for example. I used to play competitive soccer when I was younger, and the really good soccer players are the ones that not only are thinking about who they're going to pass the ball to, but they're thinking about who the person that they pass the ball to is going to pass the ball to and who that person is going to pass the ball to, right? And the same is true with bicycle terrain. So that like you are thinking multiple steps ahead on your bicycle tour. So that, you know before you even roll into a town, you're already thinking about the next town beyond that town so that you know how much food and how much water you need to get. Right? Anyways, um, yeah. Good Soul says, have you ever been robbed on route? No. No, no. And no. <laughs> but I have heard of, I mean, it has happened to people. Um, like I just interviewed recently, oh, not recently, but I met up with Pat and Cat Patterson, um, who are a couple from Southern California here. They're a re retired couple. They spent several years riding their bikes around the world, and they were robbed at gunpoint. Um, I think they, you know, handed over some cash, and that was pretty much the end of the story. But there's been other incidences of people being robbed, but it's very, very rare, I have to tell you. Um, Shane says, how effective are your solar panels? Do you recommend them as the best way to create self-power? Um, we had a question just a moment ago about Dynamo Hubs. I honestly think, I, and like I said, I haven't used the Dynamo Hub myself extensively, but um, I think that if you wanted something more reliable for your bike tours, then the Dynamo Hub is probably the way to go. Solar, obviously, requires the sun, and there are a lot of places in the world where you can ride and ride and ride, but there's just not a whole lot of sunlight. Like, I've done bike tours in Ukraine and Iceland, uh, and I, you know, this year I'm going up to Nordkap, Norway, and that sort of thing. Um, so in those places, like the sunlight may not be direct enough or bright enough to really power um, a small solar charger. You know, and that's the other thing too about solar chargers is like on a bike tour, you want something that's going to be light and small. But the problem with solar is you need something kind of big in order to really create a lot of power. So um, that's why I think the Dynamo Hub is probably the best way to go, but it's expensive, it adds weight to your overall bike, adds a little bit of resistance, that sort of a thing. So there's some drawbacks, benefits and drawbacks to both. Uh, the Jambo says, which part of Finland are you going to? Um, I'm just going to like Lapland, Northern Finland, basically. Um, that's, that's it. I've already done a bike tour in Southern Finland, Southern and Central Finland, so I'm, I don't really want to go back to those areas. Uh, Tim Nino says, how do you find the isolation of long tours? That's a good question. Um, I think what you're asking is, do you find it like concerning when you're alone or something like that on a long bike trip? And the answer is, it depends. Um, 
I think the first concern, like if you're traveling alone, the first major concern is just personal safety, right? Because if something were to go wrong with you, you're, you're to get sick, you fall off your bike and hurt yourself, like you are your own source of rescue in that scenario. Um, and you're going to be relying on the kindness of strangers to get you out of a situation, right? Um, so that's the first thing. Uh, whereas, you know, if you have someone traveling with you and you fall and break your arm or something, that person can help you get out of the situation. Um, but beyond that, as far as like being lonely or something, um, this is something as well that I've talked quite a bit about inside the Bicycle Turn Pro Coaching Program. Um, there's a whole lot of benefits and drawbacks to going by yourself versus going with a partner and that sort of thing. I think overall it comes down to knowing yourself and knowing like whether you have what it takes to be alone for a long period of time or if you don't. You know, like I have friends that can't stand being alone for more than five minutes and I kind of understand that. Um, so like I'm very different. I don't, I, I could be alone like for a year and not be bothered at all. Um, but yeah, so I think it just, you know, it kind of depends on yourself. Like how are you going to be most comfortable? But yeah, one of the things that I, I should say about the whole like traveling with a partner versus traveling alone sort of thing is like, I did my first long distance bike tour when I was 17 years old. And um, at that time, like my parents didn't want me to go on the trip by myself. And, and so like I recruited three of my best friends to go on the trip with me, my first bike trip uh, with me. And that was awesome. But the next year I wanted to do another bike trip and I wasn't able to find anybody to go on the trip with me. They were all busy with work and school and, whatever else they were doing in their lives. So um, that was the year where I had to decide, like, do I want to go alone and be alone potentially for the first time in my whole life for an extended period of time, or do I want to basically wait until I can find somebody to go on the trip with me? And for me, waiting meant not going on a bike tour that summer. And, and, you know, it may have meant not going on a bike tour the following summer. Um, and, and so for me, like, I made the decision um, to go alone on my second bike tour, not because I necessarily wanted to. I wanted someone to go with me. But um, I wasn't willing to not go on the bike trip simply because I couldn't find a travel partner, right? So my desire to go on the trip was greater than my desire to have somebody go with me. And I think that's been uh, a pretty powerful lesson for my entire life, actually, because I think, um, you know, if you spend your whole life waiting for other people, you could spend your whole life waiting for other people and really make none of the forward progress that you want to make. Um, so, yeah, it's kind of a life lesson there, I think, for me at least, um, was, yeah, nowadays, you know, I, I am very quick to invite people to say, hey, you want to come on my bike trips? Or I'm even like when I'm not on my bike trips and I'm like, hey, I'm driving up to San Francisco. Do you want to come for the weekend with me or whatever? I'm very quick to invite people. But if they don't take the initiative to, to make it happen on their end, I'm just very quick to say, OK, no problem. I'll just go alone. Right. So, um, yeah. Anyways, just something worth mentioning, I guess. Okay, guys, it's already 3.10, um, and I've been going for over an hour now. I, I'm, I'll answer a few more questions, and then I'm going to say goodbye. Uh, you should do a meeting somewhere this summer in Sweden or Finland so we can meet up because I think you inspired a lot of people to start bike touring. That would be awesome. Maybe I will do that, actually. I just didn't know how many readers I had in that part of the world. I know I got a lot of readers in Sweden, um, but I, a lot of them, I think, are down you know, further south. Uh, than where I'm going to be near Stockholm and Gothenburg and that sort of thing. But yeah, let's try to make it happen. Maybe. Um, Fabian says, what do you think of the surly long haul trucker, which is probably the most popular like dedicated touring bicycle in the world for a number of different reasons, largely the price, I believe, and the availability of it. It's like one of the most um, yeah, available uh, touring bicycles in the world, whether you live in, you know, America or Canada or Europe or uh, South Africa or wherever, you can probably get a surly long haul trucker delivered to you. So that's one of the advantages to that bike 
it's a little heavy compared to a lot of other touring bikes. It's it's a mass market bike, um, and it's not like high end or anything, but it's a great starter touring bicycle. Um, Phil says tubeless tires are not. I've never had tubeless tires to be honest. So <laughs> there's your answer, I guess. Um, again, like I, I mentioned earlier about the racks, like if they break, you want to have racks that can be fixed. And the same goes with your tires, I guess, right? Like you, you, if you're doing, especially at a long distance tour or something in another country, you want to make sure that your tubes, your tires can be replaced uh, and fixed easily no matter where you are. So um, that might be the answer to your question. Eduardo says, do you get medical insurance wherever you go? <laughs> That's a good question. I know a lot of people who are touring do um, have insurance for the various legs of their trip. It can be difficult to do depending on where you choose to travel in the world and expensive. Um, I generally don't travel with any kind of like international insurance unless it's required for a visa or something like that. Um, and yeah, so I don't know. I, I don't honestly like I don't feel comfortable answering that question because I think it's I, I'm just not qualified to, to give you a good answer basically um, I just don't know enough about it um, Kim says what's your thought on electric bikes at 65 I have some difficulty with hills good question um, electric bikes are becoming more and more popular now the big downside to an electric bicycle when it comes to bicycle touring is that you basically have to be in a hotel each and every night, um, someplace that you can charge the bike for the following day, right? Because um, once your battery dies on an electric bicycle, your bike becomes like this, basically like a heavy motorcycle that you're trying to push bicycle style. And yeah, so that's the, that's the major downside. It's just battery life. Um, you know, touring, like I'm gonna ride my bike this summer, 25 days across Sweden and Norway, and most of the time I'm just gonna be camping in the forest um, and that sort of a thing. So there's just nowhere to charge an electric bicycle out in the middle of the forest. Like there will be opportunities. I could charge it at the library or something like that, but the libraries are one every three days or something, right? So again, um, yeah, I think that's the major downside to e-bikes, but I think we're gonna see more and more e-bikes in the future, even in the bicycle touring world um, as the battery life gets better and the the technology overall gets better. Um, yeah. Okay, guys, I think that's pretty much it. Um, I hope you enjoyed this. Hope you learned a little something about racks, panniers, handlebar bags, and that sort of a thing. Um, and thank you once again for tuning in. If you have any other questions, Make sure you visit my website at BicycleTurningPro.com. There's like over a thousand free articles, packing lists, things like that to help you get started. My Bicycle Turn Pro YouTube channel has got 450 videos plus, um, you know, just watching some of my vlogs, my video blogs from the road will teach you a lot about picking campsites, you know, cycling in different scenarios, that sort of a thing. Um, and then if you're interested, um, this Bicycle Training Pro coaching program, which is more of a video course um, where I teach you a lot of the, my like secret techniques and strategies for mapping out your routes and picking travel partners and um, all that kind of stuff. Um, if you're interested in that, um, you might consider joining my coaching program, which you can learn more at, at bicycletouringpro.com forward slash coaching. So um, yeah, that's pretty much it. Thanks so much guys for tuning in. I really appreciate it, especially everyone tuning in from all around the world. Um, that's really, really cool. Um, and I think it's really cool to see so many people from all the places that I've been. I think that's one of the awesome parts about bike touring, especially internationally, is that now I have like friends all around the world, um, which is really, really cool. So. And even like years, decades later, after I've met some of you, we're still in touch, which is really awesome. So um, thanks so much. Uh, once again, my name's Darren Alf from BicycleTurnPro.com, and uh, hope you guys have a great day. Um,
I got to close with my tagline and say, I hope to see you out on the road sometime soon. All right. See you guys. Have a good one and adios. Avidazen. Dovidzenya.